we are safe in his arms. When the storms of life come, he will hide us, he will keep us, he will cover us, he will be over us. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad when the storms of life are raging, he will hide me, he will keep me, he will cover me, and he will watch over me. Praise God, praise God. We thank you, Sister Tierra, for reminding us that he will hide us and he will protect us when the storms of life are raging. We greet you with Jesus' joy once again this morning, and there is a word from the Lord this morning. So if you could turn in your Bibles to Psalm 46, that's Psalm 46, and I'm going to read it in its entirety. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And we're going to focus on verse number one. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in the time of trouble. And on verse 7, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And on uh, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. And I ask for your prayers as we lift up our sermon topic this morning, how to handle panic. How to handle panic. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you once again, God, just asking you, Lord God, that you would show up and speak to your people, Lord God. Lord God, use me, Lord God, speak to me and speak through me, Lord God, so that your people can be blessed, Lord God. We need to hear a word from you in times like this. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you show up and that you speak, Lord God, because your servants, your people are listening for a word from you. In Jesus' name, amen. How to handle panic. On September 11th, 2001, panic swept through the United States when 19 militants hijacked four airplanes and carried out suicide attacks against targets in the United States. The first plane, American Airlines Boeing 767, crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City at 8.45 a.m. The impact left a burning hole near the 80th floor of the 110-story skyscraper, instantly killing hundreds of people and trapping hundreds more in higher floors. Then, 18 minutes after the first plane hit, a second Boeing 767 United Airlines Flight 175 appeared out the sky and turned sharply toward the World Trade Center and sliced into the south tower near the 60th floor. The collision caused a massive explosion that showered burning debris over surrounding buildings and onto the streets below. It immediately became clear that we were under attack. 
The hijackers, the hijackers were Islamic terrorists from Saudi Arabia and several other, several other Arab nations that were financed by Al Qaeda terrorist organization, and it's thought to be led by Osama bin Laden. They were allegedly acting in retaliation for America's support of Israel and its involvement in the Persian Gulf War and its continued military presence in the Middle East. As millions watched the events unfolding in New York, the third airplane, Flight 77, circled over downtown Washington, D.C. before crashing into the west side of the Pentagon. Military headquarters at 9.45 a.m. There were 125 military personnel who were killed along with the 64 people aboard this airline plane. And, and as this horrific act took place in New York, it, it turned out that the South Tower of the Trade Center collapsed in a massive cloud of dust and smoke. The, stu the structural steel of the skyscraper built to withstand winds in excess of 200 miles per hour and a large conventional fire could not withstand the, the tremendous heat generated by the burning jet fuel. And at 10.30 a.m., the north building of the Twin Towers collapsed as well. Only six people in the World Trade Center Towers at the time of the collapse survived, and almost 10,000 others were treated for injuries, many, and many were so severe. And meanwhile, while all of this was going on, United Flight 93 was hijacked about 40 minutes after leaving Newark Liberty International Airport in New Jersey. Because the plane had been delayed in taking off due to the events in New York and Washington, D.C. But these passengers fought the four hijackers and, 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 and did not allow them to attack another target. Because of them, because of them uh, uh, fighting, the, the, the plane flipped over and crashed in a rural pier near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And at 10.10 10 a.m., all the passengers on this flight were killed, including the hijackers. A total of 2,996 people were killed in the 9-11 attacks, including the nine hijackers aboard the four airplanes. This historic event caused panic around the United States in a manner in which we have never seen. Do you recall the panic you felt on that day 19 years ago? Do you remember where you were when they announced it on the radio and on the TV? Do you remember what you were doing? Do you remember how you were filled with panic and you wanted to reach out and call your loved ones and all of the cell phone towers were backed up and you couldn't get a call through? Do you remember where you were on that day? I remember I was pregnant with RJ, and it, that was September 11th, I was pregnant, and I was in Washington, D.C., working and trying to get out of Washington, D.C., because I was in a state of panic. I was in a state of panic because they had put all of the schools on lockdown, and I was trying to get to Janae, who at that time was seven years old and was attending Kettering elementary school in the second grade and I wanted to get to her to make sure that she wasn't panicked that she knew that her mom was okay and that everything was going to be all right but there was traffic everywhere it was gridlocked everyone was in a state of panic and so we find ourselves 19 years later in another state of panic in another crisis the coronavirus pandemic. And it's just, it's, it's just crazy because it's, it's the first state that was attacked in the United States by this virus was New York. And once again, this state had to, had to step up and deal with a crisis. And we watched as they handled the crisis, and we watched as every week when the pandemic started, as they 
they, they told, told us of people who were catching the virus and people who were dying. In New York City, there have been more than 23,000 people who have died from this virus. And while 45 would have us to believe that the pandemic is under control, the fact of the matter is there still isn't a vaccine. The fact of the matter is there still isn't a cure. The fact of the matter is people are still dealing with health complications from the virus. The fact of the matter is that people are still dying. And the fact of the matter is that there is still a sense of panic. Panic is defined as a sudden and uncontrollable fear or anxiety, often causing wildly unthinkable thoughts. It's synonymous with feeling alarmed and anxious and nervous and frightful and trepidation, just to name a few of the synonyms. And all of us at some point in our lives have felt panicked. All of us have panicked. Yes, all of us, even with our Bible toting, scripture quoting, speaking in tongue, sanctified selves, we all have experienced panic. But I just stopped by to tell you this morning that God has the antidote to help us handle panic. Yes, beloved, all of us at one point in time in our lives, and if you haven't, just keep living, will experience panic. But to ease your mind, and so you know that it's, you're not crazy and it's a normal thing to experience panic, let's just talk about some folks in the Bible who panic. And we can start at the beginning. And we can start in the book of Genesis in chapters three, chapter 3, 6 through 8, we see Adam and Eve panicking. Adam and, Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge and they were told not to eat from it, but then they ate from it and their eyes were open and then they realized that they were naked, so they sewed some, sewed some fig trees together to cover their bodies because they panicked. They panicked because then the Lord called them and they hid from the Lord because they were afraid. They, they panicked and, and the Lord called them and he said, where were you? And they said, well, we hid because we were naked. naked. And he said, who told you that you were naked? And he knew that they had ate from the tree of knowledge. And then if we go to 1 Kings 19 and 3, Elijah panics and runs for his life to Bathsheba when he hears that Jezebel has threatened to kill him. And then, if that wasn't enough, if we go to the New Testament, then we see the disciples who have walked and talked with Jesus since he started preaching and teaching and have seen him do miracle after miracle. That We see that in Mark 14, 50, that the disciples panic. They flee and they run and they are scared and they, they, they are running because they have fear. And we know that one of the synonyms of panic is, is fear, and that's what causes panic, because we are fearful. Adam and Eve, Elijah, the disciples, and even Peter, when he denied Jesus three times, all panic out of fear. Panic is also ca caused by stressors, and if we tell the tr truth, all of us have been stressed since this pandemic entered our lives. Those of us who are teleworking are stressed by the pandemic because it seems as though our bosses are watching every second, every minute, and clocking everything that we are doing. And even though we're doing a lot of work, it seems that they're still not satisfied. So every week we are stressed when we are working. We are working, but we are stressed. We are stressed because it just seems like the more we do, the more they want us to do. The more that we do, the more they want us to do because they think we are at home and we're not doing any work. So they wanted to show that we're being productive and so it just seems like they're throwing more and more work on us and it's causing stress. We are stressed in our lives because of the pandemic because now our children are, are at home 
do, doing school, they're doing school virtually. And, and we praise God for, for our educational system. We praise God for our teachers, but it's still stressful. It's still stressful for our children to have to sit at their computers all day long and be in class all day long. It's still stressful that they cannot socialize with their peers. It's still stressful that they can't have recess. It's still stressful that our parents now are, are co-teachers co with the teachers because the students are home, at, they are at home learning, so which means the parents have to make sure that they are doing their lesson. They got to make sure that they are understanding their lesson. And even our teachers are stressed because now they're, they're teaching in a virtual world and this is not something that's normal, even though it's becoming the new norm. It's really not normal for them, so it's another stressor. So it's, it's understandable that people are panicking. It's understandable that people are panicking because some people, even though some of us are blessed to telework, some folks have lost their jobs. Some folks don't know how they're going to pay their bills. Some folks don't know how they're going to pay their rent. And even though we are grateful that they have put orders in place so people can't get evicted, we know that sooner or later those, those will be lifted. And what are those folks going to do when they can't pay their rent because they have stopped uh, sending them the unemployment check? We are stressed. We are stressed as we are caring for our loved ones. We are stressed uh, as we are dealing with their health issues and dealing with our own health issues. All of this is become, coming upon us because of the pandemic. And when people feel panic, when people feel, feel stress, then they start to do what's called a, a, a fight or flight. That means either you want to uh, uh, run away or you want to fight. And many of us wish we could run away. Many of us wish we could go to another country to get away from this pandemic. But everywhere we go, the pandemic is still there. It's in other countries as well. So we need to shelter and stay in place. We need to shelter and stay right here in the United States to make sure that we are safe. And so we want to fight. We want to fight because we just are getting upset. We're getting angry. And so sometimes that's why there's so much chaos going on right now. That's why there's so much uh, more domestic violence going on right now. Because people are upset and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to handle their panic. And so they want to fight. But the word of the Lord says that we don't need to fight uh, physically, but we, we need to not fight by might nor by, by power, but by the spirit of the Lord. Psalm 46 gives us the antidote on how to handle panic. Now, the book of Psalms was written to, to provide expressions of praise and worship, and they, they were actually songs that were either sung or played instrumentally. And while many of the other songs begin with describing the crisis that the writer is currently going through, David begins the Psalm 46 by reminding us of who God is. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Verse 1 of this passage of Scripture reminds us that God does not promise that we won't Will we, that we will not have trouble, but this scripture reminds us that God will be with us in the midst of trouble. Jesus tells the disciples in John 16, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So that is our first point this morning. There is a reminder that God is our provision. Verse 1 reminds us that God is our refuge and strength. The reality is as long as we are living in this world, we will face trouble. We will face tragedies and tragedies that affect us as a nation and tragedies that affect us personally. But God promises that he will be our refuge. He will be our provision. When buildings crumble, he will be our provision. When our world is shaken by a virus, he will be our provision. When our loved ones die, he will be our provision. God has not left you as his word promised. He will be our refuge. 
And how do I know that God is our refuge? How do I know that God provides provision? Because we are all still here. Amen. There are some that God has called home and there are some this virus has taken away and there are some who have succumbed through national tragedies and national disasters. But for some reason, God has allowed us to still be here. God has allowed us to get through 9-11. God has allowed us to get through the Persian Gulf War. God allowed us to get through slavery. God allowed us to get through Hurricane Katrina. God allowed us to get through police brutality and so many other tragedies. The list goes on and on and on. But regardless of what you're going through, I just stopped by to remind you that God is a very present help in the time of trouble. God is our provision. Even if you can't remember the whole verse of this first scripture, of this first verse of this scripture, all you need to remember is that God is. You see, the word is is, is used as a verb. The word is expressive ex existence or a state of being. It's classified as a linking verb, or and it's a derivative to the word to be. So in other words, God is means that God exists. It means that God is present in the here and now. The verse doesn't say God was or God will be, but it says God is a very present help in the time of trouble. God is our provision. He is here in the present right now. Whatever we're going through right now, whatever you're going through right now, God is there. He's there in the present. He's with you right now. Just as it says in Psalm 121, verses 1 through 2, it says it like this. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. God is our provision. Then in verses 3 through 4 in Psalm 46, it says, the psalmist reminded us that he, I'm sorry, in verse, in verse 3 through 4 in Psalm 121, the psalmist reminds us that he will not let our foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. We can, handle, we can handle the panic we face by remembering that God is our provision. God is our refuge and strength and our very present help in the time of trouble. Psalm 46 goes on to tell us in the following verses that, Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake, they're surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. The psalmist is reminding us that national disasters will come upon the earth, but God will be our protection. And that's our second point. As we celebrate National Preparedness Month, we need to remember that God is our protection. In verse 7, it states, the Lord Almighty is with us. Again, there's that word, is, which reminds us that this means in the present tense. That God is with us. That God is our protection. That God is the God of Jacob is our fortress. And we all know who Jacob was. Jacob was the son of Isaac and Rebekah, and he had a twin brother named Esau. Now, you all remember Jacob. Y'all remember that Jacob deceived Esau into selling his birthright for a bowl of soup. Jacob then tricked his father while he was on his deathbed and received the blessing that was meant for Esau. Jacob had fled from his home for fear Esau would kill him after he deceived their father and, and, and knowing that he had stolen his birthright. And so, but God appeared to Jacob in a dream at Bethel, and that's found in Genesis 27, 10 through 15. And he told him this. He told him he would give him the land he was laying on and, and give it to his descendants, and they would be like the dust of the earth. He, they would be spread out 
from the west to the east and the north and the south. And all people on the earth will be blessed through them. And his offspring will be what? Be blessed. And he told him, I will be with you wherever you go. I will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you. I will do as I promised. The psalmist is reminding us, just as uh, God reminded Jacob, that he is with us. He will protect us. He will watch over us. And he will keep him. Even though Jacob did wrong, God was with him. And that's a word for us. God is our protection. Even when we do wrong, God is still watching over us. God is still protecting us because he knows us by name. He has called us. He has adopted us. And that's a word for all of us. God is, is with us even when we have done wrong. He will not leave us or forsake us. Even when we have done wrong, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Even when we have done wrong, we will be the head and not the tail. Even though when we have done wrong, he that began a good work in us will see it through the day of completion because God is our protection. But just be clear, we will still have to face the consequences of our actions. And we know that Jacob ended up facing consequences for his actions because then when he went to uh, go uh, live with his uncle Laban and he met uh, Rebecca and wanted to, I'm sorry, met, met Rachel and wanted to marry Rachel, that he had to work for his uncle for seven years, and then his uncle deceived him. So when you deceive someone, that, that, that what you reap, you will sow, amen? And so then he was deceived and ended up having to marry the older daughter, Leah, and then had to work seven more years for Rachel, and then an additional six years. So that means he ended up working for 20 years, pastor, before he was released, amen? So even though God will protect us, we still will have to deal with the consequences of our actions. Then in verse 10, God admonishes, admonishes us to be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the, in the earth. This verse reminds us that in order to handle panic, we've got to get in the presence of God. When, because when we get in the presence of God, his presence will calm us. And that's our third point. God's presence will calm us. This verse does not mean to stop all act activity and to stand still and do nothing, but it encourages us to reflect on God and what God is able to do and what God is capable of doing and how we cannot do anything by ourselves, but how we need to depend on him and how we need to develop spiritual serenity or spiritual calmness. We aren't going to develop spiritual calmness by not having troubles, but we develop spiritual calmness by getting in God's presence in the midst of our troubles. There is something about getting in the presence of God and having a little talk with Jesus that will make everything all right. And so I, I just want to give y'all an object lesson. So uh, three weeks ago, uh, as you all know, RJ's in basic training. So three weeks ago, I, I got a call from RJ. And um, so he'd been quarantined for two weeks because they quarantined them when they first get there because they're all coming from different places and they don't know, you know, if anyone has tested or what anyone has. So after the first two weeks of quarantine, then they test them for, for COVID. And so when they tested them after the two weeks, he called me to tell me that he had tested positive. And so, uh, you know, I was like, I'm not going to panic because I don't want him to panic. I want to remain calm because I want him to be calm. So I just asked him, are you all right? He said, yes, I'm okay. I don't have any symptoms, but now I have to stay in quarantine for two more weeks. So now that's two weeks he's been in quarantine, so plus an additional two weeks, which means he can't start training because he's got to go back into quarantine. But then I reflected on this scripture. It said, 
God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in the time of trouble. I remember that God is our provision. He can get to RJ. He can protect RJ. He can cover RJ when I can. But what I can do so I can remain calm, so I won't get upset, is I can remain in God's presence. I can keep praying. I can keep reading the scriptures. I can keep listening to the to gospel music and keep knowing that God will heal him. I can keep calling out his name and calling the name of the other recruits as well, knowing that God will protect them. Then last Saturday, I received a call from RJ telling me that he was fine and he was released from the additional two weeks of quarantine. And now he's officially headed to boot camp. And that was one week ago. So that means he's now in boot camp and he's on the path that God has destined for him. And of course, that, that was a great praise report. And I was thanking God and shouting and thanking God for that. But then I, I went to the mailbox and I had gotten a letter that he had written while he was in quarantine that he wrote to me and he said he was he said I got about six days left in quarantine and he said but while I've been in quarantine we've been having Bible study and while I've been in quarantine I've been reading this book by Max Licato called Trade Your Cares for Calm. See it's one thing for us to pray for our loved ones. It's one thing for us to ask God to heal them. It's one thing for us to ask God to protect them. But oh, how it blesses the Lord when they can get into God's presence for themselves, when they can pray for themselves, when they can seek the Lord for himself. So he had been seeking the Lord for those additional two weeks while he was in quarantine. And Mexicano during this time of the coronavirus created an acronym for CALM. So I want y'all to remember this. The C stands for celebrate. God's goodness. So we got to stop looking at our, our problems and we got to celebrate God's goodness and what God has done for us. And then the A stands for ask God for help. Let your request be known to God. And then the L stands for lead your concerns with God. And let him take charge, knowing that, that God is going to handle it. That means when we pray, then we need to trust that God is going to handle it. It's just like when you take your car in for service. You don't stand there and wait for the man to repair the car. You leave the car.